All right, good morning, everyone, and congrats for finding this room. You guys are all exceptional. Uh, I'm Brent Weinstein. I run digital media for United Talent Agency. Uh, I oversee the agency's work in online entertainment, including our work with digital influencers, YouTube stars, Vine stars, the companies that specialize in that space, as well as our ventures work, where we're incubating in and investing in early stage companies, as well as our corporate practice, where we advise large companies like Delta Airlines. Uh, excited to be here at MIP to talk about new media moguls. Uh, and before I get to one-on-one -on -one interviews with three of the moguls that are changing uh, the landscape of media today, I'm going to take you through sort of a brief history of what it means to be a mogul. So uh, the magic button. There we go. So you know, what is a mogul? Is it influence, power, uh, the ability to get the proverbial stuff done? Uh, the answer is definitely yes. You know, it all started with these guys who would probably be on Mount Rushmore of Hollywood if there was such a thing, guys like uh, you know, Daryl Zanuck and Louis B. Mayer and the Warner Brothers. Uh, they had so much power, so much influence, they could get pretty much anything done with you know, a swipe of their pen, uh, an angry phone call, or even a discerning look. Um, there was very little in terms of art artist power, uh, in terms of power that was wielded by the individual. Uh, Charlie Chaplin and his friends created United Artists in I think, 1918 to try to carve some of that power back, but the reality was at the time, the studios owned everything. They owned the lots where you made the movies. They owned the stars who appeared in the movies. They even owned the movie theaters uh, and the popcorn. And it persisted this way until the Justice Department said, hey, this isn't going to work for us. Uh, they deemed Hollywood a monopoly and busted up the system. They said, you know, studios, you can no longer control everything end to end, and that created sort of the dual system we have today where you have the studios like Paramount and Disney, Warner Brothers, Fox on one side, and the distributors like AMC Theaters, Regal, Lowe's uh, on the other. That created probably the first real shift in power and balance in Hollywood because it took some of that leverage away from the studios who controlled everything. The next meaningful shift came with the invention of uh, the box that sits in people's living room. Uh, it was really the first time that there was an alternate platform for creators and for the representatives who helped take their projects to market. And over the coming decades when you know television went from four channels to this, uh, it became even more so. Now, for the first time in history, uh, there were so many options where you as an artist could go to create your work. Uh, you could go to broadcast, you could go to cable, you could go to pay cable. There was still the theatrical experience. And as a result of all of this option, of all these different buyers who were competing against each other for the best product, it created a system where there was leverage now on both sides. And by the early 90s, uh, there was really a system where there was a fantastic symbiotic relationship between on one side the major media companies, Disney, Time Warner, etc., and on the other side, the huge talent, the stars, the filmmakers, the television show creators, and the agencies who represented them. Uh, in the early 90s, it was widely uh, believed and, 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 and agreed upon that Michael Ovitz, who ran CAA at the time, was the most powerful person in Hollywood. And while there's not a single person that wields that much power today, this sort of dual system of, of leverage, of checks and balances, persisted through the 90s and into the 2000s. The WGA writer's strike of 2008 changed that a little bit, where a little bit more leverage shift back to the studios as they started making fewer product. But that was counterbalanced by the television business and the explosion of basic cable and the original programming efforts of places like AMC and FX. So all of this was happening, and for the most part, this symbiotic relationship between buyer and seller exists today. But in the background, in the mid-aughts, um, YouTube came on the scene. And while traditional media viewed it as a bit of a sideshow, uh, there was a tremendous shift in power uh, as a result of this platform, which for the first time allowed people to self-publish. You know, no longer had to go to Warner Brothers or go to NBC in order to make content and get it in front of a large audience. And at the beginning, it was a novelty. There was some you know, really popular people who were sort of the William Hung of the internet um, who, you know, amassed a lot of viewership, but no one ever really looked at them and said, these are going to be the Tom Cruises or the, you know, Francis Ford Coppola's of the medium. Of course, that changed. Um, YouTube today uh, and digital media generally is an ecosystem with a tremendous number of individual stars who have built followings, for the most part, on their own. 
uh, who wield a tremendous amount of influence over a huge audience and who understand that digital media, uh, distribution to consumers direct through the internet, through internet connected devices, is as different of a platform from television as TV is from film. It's all content, it's all entertainment, but the form factor is different, the expectations of the audience are different, just like you have a set of expectations when you go into a movie theater and sit down to watch Gravity, and you have different expectations for what you're going to experience when you watch Breaking Bad at home, the expectations of the audience on the internet are wildly different, and creators like this, Shane Dawson and I, Justine, and Lucas Cruikshank and the Smosh guys, they figured it out early on, and they're just a few examples of a wide universe of stars that have emerged from this platform. You know, in addition to the individuals, uh, there are huge companies now that have emerged from the space. Not a single one of these companies existed 10 years ago. Um, but when you think of Awesomeness TV, which sold to DreamWorks, and we'll talk about them in a moment, or Maker, which just sold to Disney in a deal that could be worth close to a billion dollars, Taste Made, What's Trending We'll Hear From Today, Fail Blog, and the network of sites that Ben Ha created at Cheeseburger Network. These are the media companies, I said of the future, but really of the present. And the access and the influence they have over huge audiences uh, is something that probably nobody expected uh, even a few years ago. The fact that Awesomeness through its network is doing a billion video views a month and Maker is doing seven billion is just an order of magnitude larger than anyone would have predicted. There's also an explosion of new platforms. In addition to YouTube, consumers are getting content from so many different devices and there's so many people that are figuring out how to leverage that. We're seeing Vine stars, we're seeing popular personalities on Reddit. Instagram has really taken off even as something that is owned by but very different from Facebook. Snapchat is something that brands are starting to leverage in a big way through Snapchat stories and of course Vimeo and we'll hear from Carrie in a bit. So, you know, a few case studies, and this will just take a minute or two, then we'll get into the conversations I know you're looking forward to. I mentioned Awesomeness TV. Um, you know, this is a great example of something that just wouldn't have been possible uh, 10 years ago. Brian Robbins, the founder and CEO of Awesomeness TV, was one of the more successful producers of content for teens and tweens, maybe in film or TV history. At one point, he was responsible for almost all of the live action programming on Nickelodeon. He had huge movies like Varsity Blues, big shows on the CW and WB networks like Smallville and One Tree Hill. But he was seeing that the ratings on all of those television networks that catered to his audience were falling off of a cliff. Not so much on the preschool side, Nickelodeon was doing great with Dora, but when you looked at the ratings for their live action stuff for teens, it was dropping dramatically, and at the same time, the viewership of YouTube in the same demos was skyrocketing. And he said to himself, I'm gonna fish where the fish are. And he created a company, Awesomeness TV, which was designed to be, for lack of a better analogy, the CW or Nickelodeon of the internet. And he raised venture capital, put together a management team, started making programming, launched Awesomeness to consumers uh, in the summer of 2012, and nine months later, in April of 2013, sold the company to Jeffrey Katzenberg and DreamWorks Animation. And the integration with DreamWorks has been seamless, and the company continues to grow, as I mentioned earlier, doing over a billion video views a month through its aggregated multi-channel network. Maker Studio, as I mentioned, uh, this is something where, you know, hearkening back to the Charlie Chaplin United Artists days, a handful of YouTube stars got together and said, individually, we're doing all right. We all have our subscribers, we all have our video views, we're making a little money through advertising, but imagine what would happen if we all banded together. And what started as sort of a tiny artist colony in Marina del Rey, and then a tiny shop over a taco stand in, in Playa Vista, uh, resulted in a company that now employs several hundred people doing a significant amount of revenue, doing close to seven billion, if not in excess of that, video views per month, and again, sold to the Walt Disney Company for $550 million with an earnout that could make the deal worth closer to a billion. It all started with a few people who got together and said, we can do this on our own. They didn't ask for anyone's permission. They didn't have to go knock on the door to a media company. They said, we're gonna take the audience that we control and we're gonna build a massive company around it. You know, we've talked about companies. Here's a few more individuals. Uh, Jimmy Tatro is sort of the ultimate bro. Uh, he's built uh, a popular YouTube channel called Life According to Jimmy, very fratty humor, fraternity humor, uh, and he's a guy who built up a big audience, and he still, though, said, I want to be in film or television. Uh, I want to do both, and 
when he was introduced to producers and directors and casting directors, they caught on pretty quickly. Not only that this guy was a really talented performer, but that he could bring a huge audience with him. And he was cast into a role in 22 Jump Street, the sequel to the very popular film from a few years ago, where he's opposite Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill and Ice Cube. And the director and the producers of the film loved his performance so much and loved the enthusiasm of his audience so much that they rewrote the role to make it significantly better. And now he's the fourth lead in the movie behind those three superstars that I've just mentioned. Andrew Batchelor uh, is a very similar type of performer in that he started on his own. Uh, but he, unlike everyone else that we've mentioned, started on Vine. Vine didn't exist a few years ago. And now you have guys like Batch who have over six million followers on the platform and who are leveraging that audience into opportunities in film and television and the consumer products world. He's doing brand endorsements. He is a reoccurring uh, character on Showtime's TV series, House of Lies and he just got cast into Adult Swim's first live action series, Black Jesus. The Workaholics guys uh, are another fantastic example. These guys were making sketch comedy for the internet. Uh, they had a comedy troupe called Mail Order Comedy. Uh, they had never worked in long form before, but they had not only an audience, but they had a real vision for where their brand of comedy could go. And they got together one day and said, we got an idea for a TV show, but we're not just gonna sell it. We wanna star in it, we wanna produce it. And uh, that idea became Workaholics, which is one of Comedy Central's biggest hits today. So those are a few examples of how uh, today's artist and today's executive, today's producer, uh, how they're becoming moguls through uh, their direct access to fans, through the influence that they wield with large populations and demos. And you know, in order to explore the notion of what it means to be a modern day mogul, uh, I'm pleased to have Damon and Shira from What's Trending, Ben Huff from the Cheeseburger Network, and Carrie Trainer from Video. We're going to have Vimeo. We're going to have a 15 minute conversation with each of those three. Uh, and I'm going to leave a few minutes at the end of each of those uh, for questions from the audience. So have them ready and we'll jump in. So without further ado, Damon and Shira from What's Trending. So, you know, before we get into it, you know, I want to talk about how you created What's Trending. Both of you guys had professional lives before coming together to create What's Trending. Talk about what you were doing before this. You know, I know Damon, for example, you worked at a very traditional television network and studio. Uh, talk about what you guys were doing before getting here. Well, I, you know, we'd, we'd both in our own way been uh, involved in the early stages of some of the, the companies that had uh, pre predated some of the companies that you listed in the presentation. Um, I was at Disney, uh, started the first digital studio called Stage Nine at the company. Um, had worked at Revision 3 and at Fox and, you know, big traditional companies. And uh, I think both of us just saw an unbelievable opportunity where we could take the things that we learned in these bigger companies and start to apply them in ways that um, we could build our own companies that could do more nimbly uh, and, and kind of in a, in a more agile way um, the things that, that we had seen be very successful in traditional media. I mean, Damon was a great exec, and he, for me, you know, um, I had always been a broadcaster, and but I was kind of in the middle of both worlds where I wasn't really getting the traditional media jobs that I wanted, but I was hosting every major internet show. I was vlogging and blogging, covering internet trends and digital culture in 2007 when it was before a lot of the talk shows and, um, you know, uh, morning shows actually interviewed any of these viral stars or covered What's Trending at all. Now, when we started What's Trending, a lot of people thought it was a fashion show. You know, and now you, when you say What's Trending, you get, oh, it's like trending topics on, you know, online and social media. And so the idea of What's Trending and how it's connecting with mainstream culture has changed since we started as well. And so for us, we always wanted to create a format that was broadcast quality because web shows were always deemed as like something that was lower and like wasn't getting the advertising money that TV shows were getting. But we wanted to create something that was authentic and interactive for the web audience. Because no one, it was always like traditional media giving the web audience and this new generation of viewers um, something that, you know, they, they thought they wanted, but they were getting on YouTube or something like that. Like, so we'd come from the trenches of the digital community and said, okay, we're gonna give them something valuable, but we are part of this audience too. It's like created by, the, by this audience for this audience. So, so when you say 
a format that's sort of native to digital. Yeah. Talk about what that means. I mean, Damon, when you were at ABC, you bought from us mm -hmm. something called Squeegees, which was really funny, and it was one of the first web serials. But like most of the things at that time, it was, hey, let's create television, but squeeze it into these tiny episodes. Yeah. I don't know if a lot of thought went into what is specific about it to the internet other than duration. What does it mean to sort of create content that feels more native to the net? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a few things there. I think that there's an experimentation that we're still going through, that we're trying to figure out um, whether you're a vlogger uh, like an I, Justine, that is somebody who's talking directly to the camera, or directly to their audience, or you're producing short form, real time uh, news style content. Um, it just, I, I think there's a, a, a wide range of what we're seeing with formatting for the online audience. And I think with what's trending, what we were really cognizant about doing is creating a format that was, that had the hallmarks of the quality of television. But to Shira's point earlier, was organic and interactive for the online audience to participate in. You know, when you look at what's trending, one of the, the key aspects to our, our property is that it not only exists in a linear form if you want to watch whatever we've done as an audience member in a lean back environment, but it also is interactive and something that our audiences can be chatting with our hosts and our influencers and be a part of the show. And that's something I think that is very unique to the online audience is having that conversation and being able to engage the audience in a way that television you know, at, at its present just doesn't do. We're the first like really high quality, consistent daily show for the YouTube audience where, you know, we were reinventing the talking head where we were having like not just random people that the talent bookers or book on network news, but we were saying these are the actually people creating the trends. These are the bloggers and Twitter people that you're following. These are the YouTube stars. These are the viral video stars. We're getting them first because we're not within the confines of a traditional company. We, you know, we were able to innovate this format and this idea from the outside and now traditional media companies are seeing the value and the advertising money and the viewership they're getting and they're wanting in but we were only really able I do believe uh, we're able to create this because we are creating from the outside we're able to shift well from the well the inside of the community but from the outside um, and because this landscape is changing so quickly, you know, if we saw something wasn't working, we were able to right away say, okay, this isn't working and it's okay, we're gonna move. And because it does, you know, storytelling does change this day and age depending on what platform you're on. If you're, you know, on Vine, you're gonna tell a story a specific way versus Instagram versus YouTube. There's a specific, that audience is specific, there's tools that are specific for that audience. Yeah. And there's yeah. and there are stars specific to yeah, that exactly. audience. I mean, you know, to back to the format, you know, uh, question, it's, the people that you you saw on the on the presentation earlier, I mean, we're talking about the size of many cable networks that their audiences reach or, or that they reach for their audiences. And though having those stars as part of the formats that we are, I mean, you know, on what's trending, we've had every single one of the people that you listed as and that you represent and that you represent. <laughs> and you know, it's I think it is really unique to this community to be able to. Um, look at these these YouTubers and Viners as stars. They are that. Let's, uh, if you don't mind, just because yeah, it's have, funny, I had this whole like list of minutes. questions and I'm like, holy crap, like, we're, a quick we don't date. have any time. All right. um, monetization, big issue. Um, there's a debate about whether YouTube is a monetization center or a marketing vehicle and then you figure out how to make money other places. You guys have done a fantastic job monetizing what you're doing through really deep relationships that you forged with big brands like Samsung. Could you talk a little bit about how that came about, you know, what it took to get someone like Samsung to invest so heavily in you and create such a long-lasting yeah, partnership. Yeah, these are long-term relationships that we've built over time. Yeah, I, I think that with um, with our advertising relationships, uh, because we were so um, put so much effort into making our our properties TV quality, there was a, a, a lowered our barrier to entry into those conversations with advertisers because we didn't have to kind of say no, 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 it's cool, everybody, you'll you'll get this they were f very comfortable with seeing the kind of work that we were doing and you know to be honest there's we're we're trying to fill the gap that MTV used to fill with an audience where MTV would curate what was cool in a broad way for you know audiences of all ages 
Um, and we're doing that very same thing for online internet trends. Yeah, we say, you know, what MTV was to music videos, we are to YouTube videos and the culture around that. So that starts with curation, uh, you know, original programming. Live events is huge to what we do. And, you know, we're one of the, you know, only online brands that consistently um, not only has presence at some of the biggest events around the world, but creates consistent, like, high quality live streaming. Um, and, and we become experts at it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it involves covering what's hot at, at that event, but also bringing the biggest stars to the Samsung Blogger Lounge. Uh, you know, working with the Ford Fiesta movement, where they had these Fiesta agents that were YouTube stars. We could have them within our show, and it feels very seamless. It doesn't feel like we're saying, this is sponsored by Ford. It just makes sense to what we're doing. So before we go to a few questions from the audience, sort of what's next for what's trending? Where do you see it going from here? You guys are, you know, a real powerful, recognizable brand in this ecosystem. Is it just sort of building and building from here, or are there big plans? Big plans. We, we have actually, we're really excited about where we are right now. We, uh, we just relaunched, or we just launched uh, last month, a new technology platform at our .com, which is a, uh, what's trending .com, uh, which is a cool, curated look at what's hot in the real-time web. And we've started with YouTube, and we're adding other social networks as we go throughout the next quarter. Um, and you know, so far, that's tripled our traffic over three weeks. Um, we are also going to make an announcement uh, about television on Thursday, and uh, we're very excited about that. So multi-platform, multinational. I mean, we're we want to grow this into a, a really you know a, as big of a media brand as yeah. we can. And this is an exciting time. I mean, with acquisitions, whether it be you know Awesomeness TV, uh, Big Frame Maker. I mean, as we see. Um, we've all, you know, been so passionate about this space and worked so hard to prove, like, and 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 really create what we want, what we wanted other companies to be doing. And so this is a special time. And so I think the sky's the limit for companies like ours who have been there from the beginning and really have um, credibility in the digital realm as it moves into a bigger space with traditional audiences. Lots of people that were there at the beginning that are getting rich. I have no idea what these <laughs> happen made, but it's a lot of money. So, so yeah. money. I have more questions, but. Uh, if the audience has none. So I, I figured I'd put it out to the audience if there's one or two questions, and if there's not, I'll just keep going. And I'm blind, I can't see anything. Oh, lights, there we go. Any questions? Just raise your hand, otherwise I got a whole list. Anyone, anyone? Oh, we yes. have a question. Sir. We want to, and that's funny, we want to do different Come languages. Come talk to us. Yeah. We want to get into we the Spanish language We want territories, languages, yeah. What's, You're hired. Yeah. It's a big thing, because there is, you know, what's trending can go across the board. It could be different verticals, different languages. Well, we, we plan on rolling out that's the plan. several different countries this year, and we plan on rolling out um, Spanish language sub. So yes, that's definitely on the, on the docket. Anything else from the audience? All right, then I'm going to go back because I have a couple more questions. So uh, you guys recently moved back to YouTube Space LA, correct? Yeah, we have a residency there. If anyone's in LA in the next three months, you can see us there. We shoot daily now from YouTube, and we are going to be uh, doing some really fun live programming throughout the summer. So, you know, going back to my initial, you know, uh, deck, uh, when you think of moguls and when you think of sort of the things that they bring to the table, one of the things was always, hey, we have this lot in Burbank. It's the Warner Brothers lot. There's a big water tower. We have this lot uh, in Hollywood at Paramount. Um, what does it mean for the community and for you in particular that YouTube invested in effectively its own movie studio lot that people can come and use? I, I think it's just an incredible facility and an incredible model that YouTube has been, um, you know, a great partner of ours and you know has been very supportive to the community at large. And you know, for them to roll out the style of resources that they did in LA, they have uh, a, you know, uh, they turned an, an old Howard Hughes. Uh, helicopter hangar into a state-of-the-art production facility that's free to use for their creators and it's it's really it's it's pretty impressive um, to be able to be a part of that and you know uh, as Shira said we're in residence and we'll be doing some really big stunted programming um, you know live from the space so uh, you know be sure to check it out on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash what's trending so you guys talk about big events you talk about programming um, what is next on the calendar? Like, if people are following you, what's the next big thing that you guys are doing that you're excited about? Well, on Monday, we have Jason Derulo coming in. Oh, yeah. If you're a Jason Derulo fan. Actually, we're really excited about VidCon. 
You know. Oh I yeah, VidCon's gonna be huge. It's like for some people who might not know com the Comic Con of YouTube. How many? Well, you uh, you work with VidCon. How many people will go attend? There'll right be now? about twenty thousand screaming fans. Yeah, there. this is like tween. If you ever wanted to yeah. know about YouTube and you're you kind to of are, the are excited about life. wanting to know what is happening with that community, it's really something to go to VidCon and see. You know, people like Dave Days be treated like he's John Lennon. I mean, Last it's year, there was really just, incredible. There was a line. It, it, it took seven hours to wait in line for Tyler Oakley's yeah, autograph. It's, it's yeah. crazy. So we're going to be uh, going live from there, interviews with the biggest YouTube stars, um, hosting some other programming from there. Comic-Con as well is, is coming up for us. Uh, so throughout the summer, we'll be, you know, definitely at every major kind of event in pop culture. And, and you know, maybe one last question before we bridge into uh, the next uh, fireside. You know, we've been talking a lot about YouTube, but you know, online entertainment is blowing up across multiple platforms, and VidCon in particular, it really isn't a YouTube conference, it's a, a celebration of all digital yeah. content. There's gonna be a lot of Vine stars there, there's mm -hmm. gonna be other platforms there, big publishers, like big sort of you know, websites that you would recognize. Um, how much are you guys focusing on what's going on outside of YouTube and in those other platforms? We're definitely aware of it. I mean, a lot of the talent um, that we're doing stuff with and also for the, the TV project we've announced, like definitely was YouTube, but beyond YouTube. And we're very aware, um, you know, Batch is a great friend and, you know, he stops by for stuff. And some of the YouTube stars are now even on Vine and they're focusing more on Vine than their YouTube channels. Yeah. Like, I mean, we, yeah. we're, we're focused on what people are, are sharing talking and about talking and sharing. About, yeah. and, and whether that's on Vimeo or that's on uh, YouTube or Vine, that's, that's, I think, what we look at trending topics, you know, it, there used to be this paradigm where, you know, a, an editor would sit in a room and, you know, be with their team and say, what are we going to talk about today? What, if, what do we think people want to know more about? We don't need to guess that anymore. We know what people are talking about and sharing, and that's what is news to us. And so we, you know, we do cover routinely Vimeo videos and we cover, you know, Viners and, you know, it just depends on, on what's hot. Also, you can't be too comfortable, you can't get comfortable with a certain platform. We've seen that in the past, getting too comfortable. It's like where it's gotten us. You haven't so, visited my MySpace page in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's Poor time MySpace. to be aware of what's out there and how people and young, you know, are innovating, telling stories and how, con what consumers really want and this generation and go out there and, you know, get there in the trenches and find out. Awesome. Well, on. thanks to Damon and Shira. So everyone, a round of applause for Damon thanks, and Shira. Guys. They'll be outside afterwards Thank if anyone you. has questions. And I'm going to now ask come. Ben Huff from the Cheeseburger Network to come on up. Come on, Ben. Yeah, Ben. <laughs> hey, Brent. I don't have a video for you, so we'll you don't just have do a video? this mano a mano. Yeah. Should we just, like, improv? We'll just improv. Pantomime? Sure. Nice. Uh, so, like, for the... Two people in the room who have never been to Fail Blog or I can as Cheeseburger. Start from the beginning and sure. talk about sort of what the Cheeseburger Network is. So we are a network of humor-related, happiness-related content sites. We do video, pictures, text. We do a, a multi-format way of delivering uh, through mobile and through the web a way to make you laugh. Our mission is to make the world laugh for or happy for a few moments every single day. And now we are one of the largest destinations for humor on the internet. Um, we've raised uh, almost $35 million of venture capital, and we're based up in Seattle, Washington. And when you say one of the largest sites on the net, you know, I'm not sure people know, but the numbers are just staggering. Could sure, you walk sure. us through what some of those metrics are? Sure. Half a billion uh, page views every single month. Uh, we Failblog actually was one of the top five channels on YouTube um, when we were actually posting to YouTube, which is something we can talk about. Um, and we've got you know, 50 people working in the company uh, whose job is to curate humor. And we're really a distribution platform and a channel for people's um, content and people's ideas about how to make others laugh. I mean, in many ways, you were the precursor to things out there like BuzzFeed. I mean, you were sort of the original curator of, you know, delightful, funny things. Yeah. Yeah, and for us, it's really, we're trying to figure out entertainment. We think that there's a real problem on the internet when the best internet content for entertainment is what's from television. And I think um, Shara was right and, and Dame was right about how do we create content that is native to the internet? How do we actually take advantage of the devices that are in front of us? Because it is a radically different world, yet we are still stuck in this idea that we have to do TV the way it was done. And while the people in this room might get it, but there's still 99% of people out there who don't. And yet, 
the GIF is something that's very specific to the internet and something that's uh, been a big GIF. part of your ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, we started posting. So GIFs are a standard that's been around since 1989. Okay, so they've been around for a very long period of time. Uh, we started a site called Senor GIF, uh, which became one of the leaders that actually brought animated GIFs back into the mainstream. Now that idea of these heavyweight files being served through mobile. We're going to have to go change it all over again. These formats come and go, and we're really trying to figure out what is the next format that people adopt, like Vine, like Vimeo, like other uh, platforms out there that we want to create that helps make more stars. We want to make people famous, and we want people to know that humor is a great way to do that. So, you know, Cheeseburger is so huge today. But go back to the very beginning. You know, how did it start? What was the first site that, that you it. launched I, that really got the, the, the boulder rolling downhill? So I had a job that I hated living in Seattle. So I met this guy on the internet who um, was running the site called I Can Ask Cheeseburger. It was a bunch of cat photos with captions on it. I, I approached him over like AOL Instant Messenger. I ended up buying the site from him. The site, would eight, the site was eight months old. And then I quit my job. And now all of a sudden, I was living... I was living and working in my living room with my dog, posting cat photos to the internet. I'm like, what the hell did I get myself into? Uh, but since then, we've built more sites like Failblog, uh, Meme Base. We've acquired Know Your Meme. Um, and so we've built that business of me sitting on my couch to a 50-plus person company. And along the way, you personally have been named one of the most creative and influential people in the world by places like Time Magazine and others. Yeah, don't believe everything you read. <laughs> How is that... You know, when we talk about moguls, which is sort of the theme of the session, um, I think that that's relevant, though, because when you think of moguls, you think of figureheads, faces of organizations that, beyond what the organizations do as a business, like, they really help, you know, perpetuate it. As the company's grown and as you raise capital, how have you taken on that role of being sort of the mascot of the company? Yeah, so, so we are trying to tell people that there are more options available, that it is not just between choosing what is out there, that they can actually create something that breaks the mold. And so one of the things that we've been focusing on is distribution and platforms, the idea of technology and how it changes consumer behavior. So the fact that the world will actually get a smartphone and use that as their primary mode of computing for the next 10, 20 years is going to revolutionize the type of content that we're going to be creating, right? So when you actually look at a phone screen and see how small that is and how distracted people are in that environment, you're looking at a vastly different environment than on your laptop. And so therefore, you have to make different forms of content to actually cater to that audience. So we go out and tell people, hey, guys, it is not a shrunk down television anymore that you have to really start making content that is native to the device where you want to reach your audience. And we in the developed world, live a very different existence where we have multiple devices, we have iPads and iPhones and, and laptops and things like that. Go to the developing world where the future of consumption of media is going to happen and you are actually looking at the future of the developed world. We're not immune from that. So, you know, what is the expansion plans for Cheeseburger? I mean, you think of certainly South America and... and you know, yeah, we actually, Asia, Middle East, and Africa. I mean, Africa is an entire continent that yeah. no one's exploited yet. Yeah, if you ask Americans what Africa is, they'll right. tell you it's a country. Um, so, <laughs> welcome. Um, so, so here's the thing. We actually just launched a Spanish vertical. You already hired whoever said that. So, um, so we are actually launching into Spanish markets, uh, starting with the United States. 100% of our revenues come from advertising. Native advertising for us has been a giant uh, boon. We, we've actually been very successful in native advertising. It's been great. And so what we started doing is, how do we go out and reach audiences that we haven't reached before? It turns out that almost 20% of cheeseburger content that's already submitted has Spanish or, or Spanish themes to it already. And so what we want to figure out is, how do we actually reach that audience? Because clearly they want to engage with us. How do we give them a home? How do we give them a brand? And so uh, we're going to continue to distribute within the U.S. market, because that's where the advertising dollar is. And in terms of ad dollars, it's U.S. or North America, uh, Western Europe, Australia, and uh, Japan. But in Japan, it's a language issue. So for an English-speaking perspective and Spanish-speaking pers perspective, that is the next step for us. And do you have plans in India, Southeast Asia, Africa, we, South America? We don't. Part of, the, part of the really interesting thing about culture and humor is that you can't translate it. You can't just be like, oh, look, that's a funny joke. Let's get a translator and translate that. It has to be cross-cultural related. We have to actually go into the native market and figure out what people want in that market in terms of what they're laughing at and then create content from there. So we're really in actually interested more on the platform idea. How do we actually create a platform in which we can make more, more stars from all the 
these emerging markets from anywhere in the world so that we enable them instead of creating the next uh, a star ourselves. We want to be the place where um, you can do clever, creative, interesting things with content and formats that can be seen on tablet, phone, and on, uh, uh, on the new connected TVs that are coming out. And that's the next big thing. $60 billion uh, US alone in television advertising, and we're going to take a really big run. We as an internet companies, internet content companies, are going to take a huge run at that big screen that you spend thousands of dollars buying because we know that you're going to be in interacting with a lot of time there, and we know that, that TV real estate is something advertisers are still really interested in. So, you know, you're a tech guy. You live in Seattle, the home of Microsoft, Amazon. When you think of the television, and by the way, I'm way off book. My questions, I'm just, uh, it's fine. That's a good uh, interview right there. You, there go, you, you go. should go off script. There you go. Uh, it seems to me that television today resembles sort of WAP-based phones from like 2005. Like everyone had a flip phone, and if you were a content you know, provider, you were trying to call the guys at Verizon to get on their deck and above the fold so people could find your stuff. And then Apple said, there's this thing called the iPhone, and it's basically open internet. And it changed everything overnight, and billions of dollars of R&D into those WAP-based phones and protocols went down the tube. Is that where television is today? Is the entire notion of how you interact with that thing on your wall going to change? And if so, is that something that's going to you know, lead yeah. to opportunities so, for you? So you see uh, Amazon just released their uh, connected TV device. You've got Roku. You've got um, Apple. You've Chrome. got Samsung. You've got Chrome. You've got like everybody under the sun. Actually. Um, Google's coming out with Android TV, which I have no idea how different that is than Chrome. But I think it's I, a it's a box as opposed a, to a okay. plugin. All right, so everybody's coming out with their devices, and and one of the things that we're noticing is that um, the app ecosystem on television is it doesn't work like the app ecosystem on phones. So if you're on a phone, it's super easy to touch the phone, search for an app, download it, blah 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 blah. On TVs, they're looking more like services. They're looking more like cable now. Instead of actually having apps that you download, you subscribe to a service where it's a revenue share. So the model is very, very different because the interaction is also very different. And one of the things that we're seeing is that people are tired of making choices. Netflix is great if you want to watch some high-quality programming. But just leaving something on in the background as a passive way because that first screen, second screen experience is subjective to the viewer makes Netflix a terrible ambient system for content. And there's market opportunities there as well. You talked about revenue earlier. So you're 100% advertising. That wasn't always the case. You guys had at one point had a very robust merchandising business, and you were thinking about advertising in a really diverse way. You know, Unlike a lot of companies who have said, man, that ad market, that ad model is just too unpredictable, and it's too hard, and you have to get to super scale. What made you say, no, we're going all in on ads? Yeah, so we, we saw that, and there was a lot of fragmentation in the ad industry, especially digital. Like, it is really hard if you're actually advertising on digital today, and we've got to make that easier if we want to get more of that market share. There's a reason why Super Bowl ads in the United States continue to climb, even though average ratings for Super Bowl keep declining, because it is still the best deal out there in terms of reaching a huge audience and making an impact partly because of the, all the digital stuff that happens uh, as a sideshow from the Super Bowl. So we need to stop being the fucking sideshow, and we need to be the real thing. But until we figure that out, we'll still continue to uh, have to innovate on what ad products there are. And we think that there's a ton of room there. E-commerce was great for us. We, we, you know, we made a lot of money on e-commerce, but at the end of the day, the ad market is where a lot of disruption is happening. You mentioned earlier uh, you know, how you used to post videos to YouTube, how FailBlog was you know, a, a top channel in the environment. What made you change your mind about YouTube as a platform? It was difficult for us to monetize. It was difficult for us to actually translate that audience from YouTube to our website because our business actually happens on our site, not on YouTube. And so we thought about actually becoming an MCN. We thought about doing all those things. And at the end of the day, we had to pick one business, right? That's the reason why we got out of the e-commerce business is that we wanted to be in one business where we could be focused. And that's what a lot of digital startups have to uh, contend with. Once they figure out where they're getting traction, you've got to get rid of the other stuff and focus on the thing that is getting traction. And a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with that because you take 10% here, 20% here, and that's how you get revenues today. But you've got to figure out how to make that big leap into creating a brand new uh, a, a product that is actually going to set the world on fire. So last question, and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, you're one of the few digital media companies, maybe the only notable one in Seattle. Amazon is on a different plateau yeah, I've at heard this of those point, guys too. Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, you know, but in terms of like venture backed startup, uh, yeah. you know, privately held, um, you're, you're, you're somewhat alone up there. What is it like being in Seattle uh, as juxtaposed against like Silicon Valley or something where Turns you're surrounded out, by people? Weird geeks from Seattle can do reality shows. That's I mean, true. Thanks, Brent. Yeah. yeah. 
Ben had a reality show. How was that experience? It was actually fascinating because um, as as this weird kind of island colony, right? Like you you developed island colony colony tendencies, which is to say you're really geeky, you're kind of quirky, and people kind of catch on to that. Um, the TV experience was interesting because we learned so much. I'll, I'll step back for a second. Digital people look at old media with a sense of contempt in many ways. We'll go, ah. Oh, that's the old way of doing things. And then you actually meet them and they're like fascinating, personable people with like real passion for television and creating content. And you develop a ton of respect, especially for the hours they work. Oh my God, they're working crazy ass hours. So we totally get what it's like to actually um, uh, deal with people in old media now because we realize how much passion there is. And that's one of the things that actually you see in Seattle is that we're super passionate about technology, but we're not beholden to the religion that happens in Silicon Valley. So we're a little bit more independent thinkers. Yeah, the TV show is fantastic. For those that don't know it, it was a sort of you know, docu-style reality series set in the offices of Cheeseburger Network, specifically around the Icon as Cheeseburger site where all their editorial people would get around the table and talk about what cat pictures were going up, and it was on Bravo, and it was fantastic. So uh, I'm going to go to the audience for a, a couple questions, and again, if they don't have one, I'll keep going. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kate Bulkley, I'm a journalist. I'm really interested in your view on the advertising market. Um, you say there's a lot of disruption that can happen there. I'm just interested in how, because it seems to me like the attention seems to be going to digital more and more, particularly among younger people. And yet the money, the big money, is yeah. still in television. So what's the what's the transition and what you know what's gonna make it move or you know, you uh, say it's disruption, where is it? Yeah, so it's a little it's a little bit field of dreams. Um, if you build it they will come and, and it's a little scary to say that, but it actually has happened. It's it's happened on desktop, it's happened on video, pre rolls and things like that, and it's it is happening to mobile. We're we're starting to see mobile ad rates uh, actually rise and starting to match um, uh, web rates. So we're seeing a, a, a secular trend that's happened multiple times before. The question is, can you outlast the gap? Right? Because there's this weird gap that happens when your traffic shifts from one side to the other, but ad rates haven't caught up. And so like every few years, digital media companies are really used to going on a diet. We're like, well, that, that, that stopped working, and now we've got to wait for the next new thing, and everybody hunker back until we can figure out when the ad rates are going to rise. We see it rising, but for the first time, we're seeing things like native advertising change the game because it is no longer about disruption, uh, attention, uh, taking away advertising away from content, but now it's a little bit more symbiotic. We started to show native ads to our users and they can't tell the difference in terms of entertainment quality between uh, ads versus content. And we're seeing a lot of value being driven to advertisers there. Time for one more question. Sir. Yeah, it's interesting. Your uh, session is called Media Moguls, and the two people we've ha had before are talking about curation. And is that actually, you know, one of the things in the value chain that was not possible until you guys emerged? And is that also why, you know, you're moving away from YouTube because YouTube doesn't allow unbundling of curation, you know, to actually distribution? That's actually a really great question. Uh, flexibility is a double edged sword. Uh, and curation on our own platform, it's clearly a double edged sword. It turns out that in order to drive creativity, you have to put ideas in a box and watch it try to get out of it. And so one of the things that we're finding with curation is that it is a first big step. It is a step towards independence of establishment of voice. And eventually what, what media companies do, media technology companies, which we all are really on the stage, um, we have to take a path. Either we say we are media first and we're going to figure out how to actually bring more entertainment, work distribution deals, work licensing deals, and do curation. Uh, uh, or do t platform and curation. Uh, we're going to actually enable other people to do something. And so uh, when I see Shara and Damon, they're more on the, um, we're going to produce uh, using technology better content. Uh, you see Carrie on Vimeo, we're going to be curators and enablers. And for Cheeseburger, we're, we're looking for that balance between the two. And I think we're leaning more towards the platform side. So, Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank really you. appreciate you being here. And we'll end the session with Carrie Trainer, CEO of Vimeo. Hi. So, uh, Carrie, just to jump right in, uh, sure. you're the CEO of Vimeo. It's owned by Interactive Corp. Uh, but you've been in digital media for a long time. Uh, why don't you, you know, for the audience's benefit, walk them through a little bit of your like curriculum vitae? You know, where you started <laughs> and launched and the whole thing. Uh, sure. So. Um, 
I uh, I actually started, I guess, in what's now the dark ages of the internet of the late '90s, sort of, you know, in very much in the first boomtown years. Um, I started at, a, at an early music startup called Launch.com, and we were doing um, video and audio streaming, you know, over the internet when we were all super fired up about the advent of the 56k modem. Um, no joke. I mean, it was literally like streaming flashcards. It was it was ridiculous. I mean, the videos were literally an inch by an inch, but you know, just the the early promise. I think you know we probably all share that experience. Is when you when you get really freaked out by by just how powerful digital media is and how it changes all of the all of the rules. Um, you know, so that happened for me in in '99, uh, and then um, that company was subsequently bought by Yahoo in 2001. Um, so we basically built launch into um, Yahoo Music. Uh, I then left Yahoo. I started my own company, a small photo publishing company called Flipgloss, uh, which was sold to Forbes Media in 2009. Uh, then I uh, did something very strange, and I joined the uh, turnaround team at AOL, um, sort of going from a four-person startup into a, you know, sort of very troubled oil tanker of the internet. Um, but it was a, it was an awesome experience um, because I think one of the things that really defines the web, uh, more than anything else, and I think it's it's actually you see it incarnate here. Is it's small teams and large companies kind of all working together, and and you know massive tranches of innovation can come from very small companies. And um, I think you know there's no such thing as a 12-person steel mill. Um, and whereas you know in the internet you have these massive companies and these small companies kind of all working together, and so um, Vimeo for me was was kind of the result of having done uh, a couple of startups, worked at some bigger companies, and so it's been very exciting to join the company when it's kind of moving out of startup phase and moving into growth phase and, and you know, really trying to um, unlock the full potential of our platform uh, without changing anything that made Vimeo special in the first place as a product. So I want to dig in on Vimeo, but, you know, one question before that. You've worked, and we're talking about moguls, and you've worked for a number of them, both on the traditional and the digital side. You were with Terry Semmel at Yahoo and Tim Armstrong uh, at AOL, and now you're with Barry Diller at IAC. Um, you got all the baseball cards. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what do you take from guys like that uh, who have such vast experiences, different experiences? Terry Semmel ran Warner Brothers. You know, Tim was obviously an early guy at Google. Barry's Barry is one of the, the titans in media. What do you take from that, and how do you put it to work in your day-to-day -day job as the CEO of Vimeo? Yeah, well, I mean, I feel very lucky for having you know worked worked under all of those people that you mentioned, and um, it's actually it, it relates a bit to what Ben was saying, where you know one of the most um, one of the greatest things about the web is is that um, you often get this very singular focus. Um, you know, some call it that native focus on, look, this is where this medium wants to go, and you can feel the inherent power of it. And yet, at the same time, the, the danger is, is Silicon Valley particularly um, really becomes an echo chamber, you know. And so, in the way that, that Ben articulated, which I agree with, is, you know, when you get that sort of combined exposure to the, um, you know, the new media and the digital DNA, and you get to have the experience of working with um, people who have decades of experience in the traditional media industry, um, you know, to me, that's been extremely, extremely valuable. So whether it's Terry or uh, Barry, certainly from the traditional point of view, Tim, you know, is more of, a, of an internet uh, native himself. But, you know, when you talk about disruption and innovation, particularly in the programming sphere, I mean, the things that Barry in particular has done throughout his career, you know, in broadcast television and feature films, um, you know, launching new networks and new formats, um, it's a really, really great um, to be able to draw on that experience. So, you know, you were at AOL, you were on Tim's team. Um, Tim famously took out the wall of his office. There's no, like, fourth wall. Like, his office is just open like a living room, which I thought was always interesting. Um, what was appealing about Vimeo when you got the call from Barry saying, hey, I want you to come and do this? What was it that made you say, wow, this is an amazing opportunity? Um, well, you know, first and foremost, I I'm, I'm a product person, and, and, you know, I had been a fan of the Vimeo product since, since the earliest days. So I've been with the company now for two years, but Vimeo was founded um, back in 2004, 2005, and um, I always loved it, and I always thought that it had something very distinct, and it was clear that they were trying to do something different than YouTube. So that sort of first fundamental spark of, you know, 
seeing a product that I could really, really relate to. Um, and then um, second, you know, it was just at a very, very exciting phase. You know, as I said, like my favorite experiences of, of all that I've had is, you know, when you know that you've got something that's really working, um, and then you have this opportunity to take a product and turn it into a business, um, and do so in a way, though, again, though, that's very respectful of what the product is. You know, Vimeo had all of those characteristics. And then, of course, uh, you know, I'm personally very passionate about content and creativity and, you know, really what digital is doing to empower creators. That's really what drew me to start working uh, in the music space in the first place. Um, you know, it was my love of music. And then I fell in love with technology along the way. Um, and so it, that mission of Vimeo's, which we believe very deeply in, is, is by providing super high quality technology to empower creators. All of those things really just lined up very well for me. So, you know, to Ben's point, there's the companies that focus on making content and the companies that focus on being a platform for those content creators. You're clearly on the platform side. Talk about how that value proposition has changed, what Vimeo means to a creative professional? Because for a long time it was about sharing or about yeah. password protected files where you could use for edits. Um, what is it today? And, and, and you've certainly made some announcements over the past few months. Talk about that. Sure. So it, look, it remains absolutely those things. I mean, as I alluded to, Vimeo, since its founding, um, is really focused on providing creators the highest quality, most uncluttered environment possible to share their work. Um, you know, Vimeo was the first video sharing site to offer true HD streaming over the internet, which was kind of a big step forward and I think really solidified its relationship, particularly with, um, you know, professional or, or, or higher quality creators. Um, and as you said, it, it really gained its, its momentum through um, our position for those professionals, our, our role in the workflow, as you said. You know, I think a lot of the clips that flow through the, your offices um, you know, come from Vimeo and come as password protected links. Um, but the really exciting next phase for our business is um, now also becoming a, a, a source of revenue for creators. And, and we've made the transition from just being a sharing tool um, it was the launch of our new product uh, about a year ago called Vimeo On Demand, where creators, um, subscribers to our Vimeo Pro account can now offer content um, for paid consumption. Um, they can offer at any price they wish, in any country they wish, in any format they wish, a stream, a download, um, and we're only taking 10% of the revenue. Um, because what we believe in is, um, look, I think the ad-supported economy is, is incredibly powerful and will continue to grow. Um, you know, I spent a lot of my earlier career working in ad-supported products and I believe in them. But what I also believe, and based on the traction that we've seen in Vimeo On Demand, is that advertising will be only one business model and I think the opportunity for great creators to charge directly for their work um, is incredibly exciting and, and we really want to be powering that market for creators worldwide. You know, Maker Studios, Awesomeness, these multi-channel networks uh, exist because of one problem that I know you've recognized in the marketplace, which is until you get to massive scale, that ad model is really not all that interesting. For every million video views, you're lucky to make a thousand or a few thousand dollars. Um, and most individual content creators can't get there. Right. Um, talk about how your direct model, um, you know, competes with other things that are like it in the marketplace. There was Chill, they're gone, there's VHX. There's there's a number of, of providers that say, hey, if you have a piece of content and you want to sell it to your audience, you can do it through us. What's the Vimeo pitch for why it's the best product? Sure. Well, I mean, the Vimeo pitch for why it's the best product really extends from the Vimeo pitch for why I use Vimeo in the first place. Um, you know, we are we are very committed to providing what we believe is, is the highest quality technical product in the market. It's the reason why um, you can certainly use Vimeo for free, um, but we also sell um, upgraded versions of our, our, our account and our tools, um, which you know now we have well over 400,000 paying subscribers for our Vimeo Plus and Pro products, um, where there are other alternatives to get video tools for free. Um, we, look at, we look at our offering around Vimeo On Demand the same way, um, giving creators the confidence that that stream will be delivered at the highest quality possible to um, whatever device they're looking to distribute on. Um, and so it's that quality and it's that trust is really lays the foundation of, of the pitch. Um, then there's also, um, you know, versus other services that are out there, um, you know, we offer unprecedented uh, control. So the idea that you can set your price, whatever you want, 99 cents and up, if you want to charge $15 for 20 minutes of content, which breaks almost every rule of iTunes, 
go ahead. And we have creators doing it, and they're doing quite well, and it's, it's really exciting. Um, same with controlling your geography. Same with controlling whether you want to download or not. Um, and then, finally, we offer um, what we believe is the best economic deal in the industry. I mean, we only take 10% of the revenues. There's no transaction fee um, as compared to other, some other open platforms. Uh, nor is there a 30% revenue share that you're going to surrender on iTunes or Amazon or a 45% revenue share that you're going to surrender on YouTube. In the tech space, a lot of times there's the talk about the balance between product and audience. Um, and there may always be a couple guys in a garage building a next product, but it's much harder to then compete if someone else is bringing an audience to the table. It seems to me that Vimeo, in addition to having product, you guys have a massive community that you can speak to. There's a choir to preach to, so to speak. Yeah. How does that come into play for the people that are choosing your platform? So, look, that's an important uh, next step for us, and um, we get asked about that a lot. You know, we're now reaching um, over 150 million viewers a month uh, worldwide, and um, certainly the uh, opportunity to unlock that audience is going to be, uh, we think, a huge next step forward for Vimeo On Demand. Um, like the company itself, our first focus is offering the very best tools we can and saying, hey, this is now possible. Um, and now, uh, from there, we're going to be breaking in much more to um, search, discovery, recommendation, and promoting content and being able to match um, you know, interests of viewers with available content from the catalog and really unlocking that audience um, for creators to take advantage of. So, you know, what type of content? You're obviously here at MIP. You have people here at MIP. Talk about the type of content you're looking for and the type of content that people can expect to see through Vimeo. Sure. Well, you know, what we're, what we're very interested in um, is... Uh, really a, a, a whole range of content, but um, one thing's for certain is we're looking for things that are generally not super served by um, other existing channels. You know, we're not going to sort of march into the same bidding war around first-run studio films at this stage in our, in our development. Not only because it's extremely uh, financially taxing, but also, frankly, it's very, it's very well covered for, on the part of the consumer. Uh, but there's so much content out there that's a very high quality, whether it's being uploaded directly by creators. We now have over 7,500 titles in the Vimeo On Demand catalog that have all been pretty much uploaded organically. And now we've just started to move into marketplaces like MIP um, and the film festivals um, to really offer, um, frankly, whether it's projects choosing to go direct or whether it's as a complement to their traditional distribution strategies, um, you know, really across genres, across formats, um, we're interested in anything um, where creators or producers want to take greater control over their path to their audience and greater control over their economics. So uh, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, as with before, we'll open it up to the audience if anyone has questions. Sir? So can, we, can anyone from anywhere, let's say even India, uh, kind of uh, create a channel for himself on Vimeo? And how does he get onto the Vimeo On Demand service? Um, well, to uh, get on the Vimeo On Demand service, you go to Vimeo.com, um, and you uh, literally just sign up for a Vimeo Pro account. And as part of the, Vim the Vimeo Pro account, um, you are entitled to use Vimeo On Demand. And from there, it's entirely self-serve. You literally go through the process of uploading a film, adding your key art, selecting your price, selecting your country, selecting your format, um, and it's then available. Uh, payment gateways, you mean the... Oh, so you can, um, it's, it, you can use credit card or you can use PayPal. Uh, right in the front here, and then we'll go to the up there. Sorry, you said that uh, uh, you want a direct relationship with the creators, but do you think there is also room for uh, uh, intermediate passage with the channels or yeah. platforms, or you want no, to absolutely. disintermediate that? No, and, and, and look, that's a great question because we, we use the, the term creators um, more broadly, but you know, I absolutely believe that platforms like ours are going to be um, one of the, we hope, will be one of the key um, tools for distributors, for sales agents, um, and, and frankly, I, I think that one of the things I'm most excited about is, is that 
Um, it's really the most successful creators and their teams, whether they be sales agents or producers or distributors, um, are going to be those that actually learn to use all the digital platforms in, in concert. You know, I think um, it's been alluded to up here, but meaning the idea of windowing is now sort of totally open season on the internet. Right? You can have ad supported to build an audience. You can have um, paid to actually serve your most ardent fans, you can go paid first, you can use different geographies. So I think the very coolest thing, and, and creators really are not going to invest the time, I don't think, they're going to want to focus on creating. You know, so it's their partners um, elsewhere in the value chain who learn to use the digital platforms that are really going to blow it open for them. Last question really quickly, and then every, all the speakers will be outside uh, in the area. Hi there, Kerry. I, um, I just want to say something really quick. Um, I think Vimeo On Demand is possibly the best thing that happened to, to uh, 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 content creators. Uh, I'm from Ghana. I, um, You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> the new chief evangelist. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Let me put it into perspective really quickly. I'm from Ghana. We create films and TV, TV series. Now, imagine this. There are pockets of Africans across the world. We haven't, until Vimeo On Demand uh, um, came, a, came along... We, 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 we couldn't distribute our content to people around the world until Video, Vimeo On Demand came, uh, came along. Um, as I speak, we signed up about four months ago. To date, we're making close to about $10,000 every month from viewers watching awesome. from America, from Asia, from India, from all over the world. It's fantastic. I love it. That's an awesome story. However... There's a slight issue, and now I would let's like just to discuss stop right this there. in person. <laughs> I would like to discuss this. And that's all the time we have. <laughs> in person. Sorry, no, what was the however? I was Sorry. kidding, please. Now, I was saying there's a slight issue that I think I need to bring up, um, but that has to be in person. Yeah, there let's definitely do that quietly <laughs> okay. on the side. All right. all right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks, Mip, for having us. Again, all the speakers will be outside in the Thanks, lounge, guys. and uh, we'll go from there.